today I am going to talk to you about Luscious Colors, which is totally a pun because I love puns. Um, so I'm, this is about uh, color grading in games, um, and I know HDR is a thing, and look up tables are being updated, but um, I'm hoping to explain some of the theory behind a lot of color grading. So, hi, my name is Izzy Graham, and I'm a photographer and games developer, and I unashamedly love color. But I particularly love color grading because of its subtleties. This talk today is to run you through my personal color grading process and show how research can help inform color grading decisions. There's an overwhelming there's an overwhelming amount of tools for color grading, which is why for this talk I've tried to aim more in a theory direction. However, if you do want to geek out about Photoshop, Lightroom, or even Unity post stack stuff, please please at me on Twitter. Um, I've tried to give more some a couple of tool tips throughout this talk, but it is very much a one-on-one -on -one and how to understand color grading and helping you trying to define a look. So the second thing to know is there's a huge difference between color grading and color editing. Color editing is often balancing the colors, so you're making the image look decent, but then there's also color grading, which is more of a look for a set of scenes or images, and it tends to be more creative and can very much focus on the storytelling. So, I really love telling stories. The first time I realized this difference was in 2014. I was quite depressed and I happened to be doing a two-week course on photography. The lecturer told us you could take any photo you wanted, but it had to be with a purpose. As part of the course, we went to, had to go to Dalesford, which was supposed to be a happy place, full of happy people, which is cool, great, mmm. But when we got there, it was dark and foggy. Like, really dark and foggy. And honestly, I had the best time making the photos look as depressing as possible. So that's when I realized that you could grade things how you feel. For this look, I called it Sad Wes Anderson, because who knew, so much, who knew how much fun it was to revel in your misery? So since then, I've had a grand old time grading things on how I want them to feel. I love coming up with different grading styles for different moments, in my life and taking on colors to remember them by. I'm also an indie games developer and I'm working on a game called Intergalactic Space Princess. It's a narrative adventure game and when I started making games, I came from a programming background. I joked a lot that my art was kind of glorified programmer art and I was too lazy to use anything but a touchpad. However, I kind of hid behind color to make my assets look maybe semi-decent, even though I was very bad at drawing. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the game later on, but for first, let's go into tools. So color grading in games sadly isn't spoken about all that often. It's my first time speaking here, so I hope that I give you a broad overview of what color grading is. And it, and turns out the games industry is really good at producing tools. But when you're faced with too many, it's easy to get overwhelmed by them. So I decided to focus my talk today isn't about explaining every single one of these sliders, but it's about coming up with your own ideas, breaking them down about what you want, and then diving into these tools to give you exactly what you want. Think of it as like picking out candy in a candy store. It's chaotic and it's so much fun to try all these things, but if you try too much, you kind of get sick and lost and lost sick, and then you're stuck in some kind of slide of hell. So it's good to go in with a purpose. It's the way I do this for myself is to make my own rule set. Think of it this way. When you create a lookup table, you're creating the rule sets telling how the colors how to behave. Why not use the same logic and create some rules for yourself? So let's go into color history. So before these nice tools and sliders were a thing, color grading was actually called color timing. What timers used to do was a chemical process that tried to predict the film and grade it all the same. This meant that they had to know exactly what they wanted before they went in. This film here is a, uh, is a road to position. While Sam Meadies did spend a lot of time and effort with cinematographer and lighter Conrad Hall, he considered using a bleach bypass on the film. However, he opted instead to keep the lighting in and to instead r subtly remove the pinks and desaturate the film overall. 
Color timing was never a replacement for good lighting, weather conditions, and mood. They simply used it to enhance what was already there. Once tools, especially color timing versus grading, started developing, color could start to give films a lot more distinctive looks. Jean Pierre Jure, like, very bad at pronouncing names, spent two years com coming up and experimenting with a look for Emily. So the other thing about color grading is you can use it to quote th different things. So this is the movie Stalker by Andrei Tarasikowski, and this is the film Annihilation. So films often quote other films, res uh, referencing the things before them. Tarkovsky said he hated color. However, I think Stalker has some of the prettiest colors, and he used a film called Ektachrome, which is like a three-step Technicolor process. It's quite easy to see how Alex Gowland tried to do a similar process in achieving a three-step color look, giving off similar green tones and powerful reds, despite not existing, despite reds not existing much in the source material, which I think that's the thing I love about most about grading. It's so easy to quote things and give off similar vibes, and co color grading is really, really powerful because it's all subconscious. So this is an experiment I tried. Um, so all my learning in photography has been through films. The way I started photography was getting through inspired through cinema and then through other mediums, and then eventually more abstract things. Because who says grading has to be realistic? So one thing about grading is you can't polish a turd, but you can absolutely roll it in glitter. Um, so these two shots were taken about 20 seconds apart, but I have graded them two completely different ways. Um, so you can really define a look just by like tweaking, tweaking, tweaking the colors. And if that's all you do, you end up having a really easy way to get a look. So for this one, I was kind of like trying to go for like those like late 80s like posters that have like the cool sci-fi stuff. Um, and then for this one, I kind of went for like the full trash kind of 80s and galaxy leggings because just because. So. For grading, it's important to know what exactly it is you want before you go in. I once got told my work was a little bit too postcardy to ever do well in photo competitions, and like an absolute normal human being, I was like, whatever, I like postcards, and then completely leaned in. One day when I was in LA, I felt like taking some nice postcards for myself. Like, you know the super old vintage ones that you find in the back of your drawer? Like, oh, Cheryl, there's a reason why I haven't talked to you in 10 years. So I kind of decided to grade it like that. So the first step I usually do is to put together a mood board. Um, I did a little bit of research and I had a look at the old 60s postcards. I was particularly interested in how postcard fail faded rather than whatever film stock was used. I noticed particularly that the deeper blues had increased in saturation and the lighter blues would fade out. This is because of the printer technology and the dyes and the ways the dyes stuck. So I started developing a rule set for myself. The dark blues would become deep and saturated, however the light blues would be faded and murky. The greens would be more desaturated and more towards mint. Reds lean in, so that means that uh, if it's a standard red, it would either become very pink if it had any kind of pink hues, or it become orange if it had any kind of orange hues. And the rest of it kind of just faded away. So with the example image that I showed before, um, this is what a grading process might look like if I put in those rule sets. And then this is the uh, process that I came up with for make the little postcards. I definitely tried to, uh, I, I did actually tweak a lot of the colors to make them look a little bit more refined than some of the dyes, but I still tried to keep the minty green tones and the deep blues as well as the faded lighter blues. So it's important to know exactly what it is you want before you go in there. Still want a photocop. <laughs> So the other thing about uh, color grading is it's good to understand colors. So, and especially how to get there. So when I was driving on a road trip with a couple of friends, I was staring out the window. I really love my friend Emmy Spicer's work who uses a lot of disposable cameras and I kind of felt like it was just this disposable fleeting moment. So I put together a bit of a mood board and had a look at some of her work and 
I found that disposable cameras are generally made from plastic. They have a low an incredibly low dynamic range. That means that the blacks get crushed and the highlights get blown out incredibly easily on a really bad curves chart which I had really fun making, it would kind of look like that. So everything kind of would exist in the middle and the, there would be no highlights and no shadows. And if you just wanted a quick way to do it, you just kind of draw like a weird S and that way you can just like clip your highlights and crush your shadows and you'll be right to go. So for the research, I started breaking down by what exactly disposable cameras are. It's easy to kind of like slap on a filter and be like, yeah, nostalgia. But for this, I was like, well, I kind of want to work out how disposable cameras work because a lot of the scans that you get of disposable cameras are incredibly unreliable and incredibly inconsistent. So I did some research and uh, broke down exactly what I was trying to quote. And I did some research on the properties of the cameras, for example, how often disposables have wacky light meters and use t cheap films. That meant that I could deduce that uh, what film stocks are used, but also that they're likely to be either underexposed or overexposed. So once I figured out what kind of film they used, I know that there's a lot of like film stock online that can teach you exactly how the colors behave. I find this research really interesting and if you're, say, doing like an 80s film, you can look up what kind of films they were using, or if you're doing like a 60s film, or even like a 1920s film, you can really break down the research and find out exactly how they achieved the colors they did. And then if you can't find reference material, you're able to uh, look at color charts to be able to work out exactly how they behave. Um, the other thing that I was looking at was how plastic versus glass lenses. So what are the, uh, how does that affect the image? So I know how ch cheaply disposable cameras are made, but my research suggests that the cameras and holgers are quite similar. So then I looked at colors behaving on plastic lens and finger smearings. Once I have done the research on this, I begin to create a rule set and understanding of what colors I want to use. There's a lot of different tools for the job, and while this isn't a tool talk, maybe hopefully the next few like process slides might be useful. So the broader overview is like sunset creates very pink tones for a lot of the cheap films, so that's a pink overlay. The blacks and shadows get crushed to green, um, so you can have green shadows. You want murky colors, so you add a brown overlay. Um, grays come to purple, blues go to gray, which you can just use using a uh, hue and saturation meter. Um, and it's really about like experimenting and working out these rule sets and then working how to get the colors and then going through your own personal slide of hell. So this is like a quick step-by-step -step of like that process. So first I add a pink overlay. Um, if you're using something like Unity, you can add like a color tint over the top. That works really well. Um, I then crush the curves, um, that's creating that little S shape. I then created green shadows. You can either do this through uh, like curves or um, like those three wheel uh, things. I just had a mental blank. Um, and then you can add browns, desaturate the blues, and usually I add like a dehaze and reduce the clarity. Um, and you thought color grading was based on feel. So the other thing about color grading is it doesn't have to be realistic. What, is, what if you want to just pick out something out of the blue? You don't have, like, how do you do the data set from... What if you uh, have a very limited data set to be inspired from and trying to work out how the colors work? So if you are using um, a, a reference image, and you don't know what colors exist, uh, it's, it's really, f uh, you can p pick it out and isolate the colors using um, a grayscale overlay. Um, so the first thing I do is easily isolate the colors with a gray overlay. I tend to do this a lot and break down the properties of something I want to quote. I definitely know there's, there's a lot of purple and orange in there, but I'm trying to uncover what the other properties are. By doing a saturation map, it's super fast, and hopefully, like, I don't have time to explain it, um, uh, the, how to actually do it, but it is very Googleable. Um, you can work out exactly what colored 
colors are used in an image. This is very useful when you're trying to break down exactly how uh, something looks the way it does. So when you're doing reference boards for color grading, you can really see what colors are used. So essentially, you basically create a map of where the most saturated bits of the image are, which I was white, and the least saturated pitch, uh, images, and then you uh, have a overlay of the original image over the top. So it makes it really easy to read. This gives me a color scheme to work from, and I love using data like this because occasionally your eyes will lie to you. So, the, sorry. So I worked out that the colors must be purple, blue, or orange. When you are color grading, it's important to make sure that you have at least three colors, otherwise an image can start to look monochromatic. For example, this image here looks a little bit nicer than this image here where I took out the orange. Um, I also wanted to, I spent a lot of time tweaking the temperatures of these image, um, and you can really work out how color grades behave with each, uh, when you have a rule set and then you adjust the temperature, it's interesting to uh, watch how the, all the other colors re uh, relate to that. I completely underexposed it because that gives it its flat and moody look. So if you look at a histogram, it's like all in the um, left part of the uh, histogram. And it gives a very uh, underexposed tint feel. So with this in mind, I used the same rule sets to create a simplistic color scheme for the next three images, and then the three after that, seeing how a rule set can behave in different light and applying subtle changes is always incredibly interesting. You don't have to base your grading on something that already exists. All you need to do is create a consistent rule set at, to work out how your colors behave. Um, Honestly, there is so much more to grading than this. Um, some of the things that I haven't Googled are secondary grading, masking, transitional grading, consistency. Um, there is so much to talk about, but for now, I'm gonna get on to video games. So one of the cool things about, even though this is not a video game, it's Steven Universe, which is great, but uh, one thing that I love looking at animation is how they get inspired by other things. So Steven Universe and Bee and Puppycat clearly uh, took a lot of inspiration from Sailor Moon. There's been a lot of really fantastic color grade, like color grading examples in games already. So like Leave a Ma by Florian is an amazing example of how you can do an incredibly awesome color scheme. Um, Dead Static Drive by Mike Blackney is also a really good example of how a uh, how he uses a lookup table throughout the game to create a consistent look. Mirror's Edge was one of the first uh, AAA games that really uh, did do a very expressive color grade and had a very like clean looking city. And Firewatch is another game that is very good at color grading. So I'm going to show you my damn game. Um, so this is my game, Intergalactic Space Princess. So the protagonist is Malene, who's a 14-year-old girl with opinions on things. The colors reflect said opinions and communicate to the player how she feels about the environment. Her hometown is beigey and dusty and she finds it incredibly boring, but when she does find some things interesting, like the fridge or falling down the intestines of an interdimensional world, worm, it's colorful. So when I was making assets for this game, I ran into a problem. I had done an asset pass in the milk bar and I wanted the milk bar to be, feel clinical, kind of like that gross plastic top that you have on those barbecue tables outside. Mmm, chemicals. So I chose the color scheme of uh, mint, red and beige to convey that look. However, it really didn't go with the rest of the game. Malene had the same opinion of the milk bar as she did with the house in the street, but luckily, as a, my experience with photography, I knew a little bit about color grading, so I decided to tackle solving this. So the color scheme for Malene's house was beige, yellow, and blue. The color scheme for the street was just like 50 shades of beige, which is awful. And I like to think that color grading is the bow, and all of, there's all the presents in front of the Christmas tree. You know which presents you got from Auntie Sandra because she uses the same bow, and despite them all having different wrappings, you can tell the, they're from Auntie Sandra because she uses the same ribbon. So I wanted to give the whole town a 
feeling of past nostalgia, kind of like those bad phone apps that make your phone look like those toy pictures. I also wanted to make sure that the accent colors didn't get lost, especially Meline. So I started developing a rule set for myself. I wanted there to be an overwhelming amount of brown, but not the realistic gritty video game brown, but a cute kind of animated fun sepia brown. And a lot of, so I did a lot of tweaking to the saturations. I also wanted the game to be desaturated without looking as desaturated as a lot of other games. Um, I also wanted the accent colors not to get affected so much by the brown, but still stand out as accent colors. So the image on the left is the one that I, is the new grade, and the image on the right is the old grade, where basically a lot of the characters are kind of getting lost. Um, so the milk bar is still standing out. I'm using Unity for this, but honestly, there's a lot of stuff doing the same. Um, you can use Photoshop to grade a lot of your things and then import them as a lookup table into Unity. And I really recommend doing this because it's really easy and really cheap and I really like grading in Photoshop, but I'm really biased, so. Um, so this is where a lookup table can come in really handy. So instead of defining, um, so it, yeah. Um, so first off, I wanted to make it look like late afternoon. I had a go at putting the initial lights in that I wanted to give it a yellow ambient light and a very subtle blue filter for the character. Once I did that, I started to work on the post-processing stack. It was still very yellow and it still really didn't go with the rest of the game. So one thing about grading is it's generally good to grade neutral. My game is small enough that I know that I can do a lot of bespoke grading through lighting and then tweak it to get it exactly how I want. However, if you, wanna, if you want your game to be fast and consistent, it's incredibly important to have a neutral base to work on when color grading. This is where lookup tables come in really handy. Because they have a low dynamic range, it means any kind of overblown highlights or shadows will get lost because they are a, a low dimension. Can words. Um, it's important to keep the scenes quite desaturated as well. Well, not too desaturated, but make sure your uh, saturations don't get crushed either. Um, so yeah, just grade neutral, I'll vlog C. Um, so I wanted to make it look like late afternoon, so put in the initial lights, and then after that, I really started to work on the color grading. So that's where I put in um, like a lookup table that was a Fuji-based uh, film filter, I edited the curves to make it like give that contrast that the rest of the town had, and I really started overlaying and uh, tweaking the color balance to make it go with the rest of the game, but still uh, being able to keep the uh, colors of the characters the same. So this is the before and this is the after. So the Final steps for, uh, so the summary for color grading is, so the step one is to figure out exactly what you want to achieve. Do you want to make it look like the 80s? Do you want to have a clinical look? Do you want to go for a sad indie band cover? It's up to you, but it's important to decide what exactly it is you want. The second step is to put some research together as to why you want the thing for your ga game. Do you want to make it look like it's from the 80s? Research the film stock they use. Do you want to make it look like Blade Runner? Start researching how tungsten film behaves. You don't have to go by research, but research helps a lot when you're trying to be consistent. And the step three is to establish an internal rule set for yourself. So this is coming up with rules to be consistent, and it's okay to be inconsistently consistent as long as you just have to decide that's what you want. Oops, I'm just, ah, there we go. Um, so research makes things easier in the long, ray, long run, which is one of the tips. Grading doesn't have to be realistic, just consistent, and grading neutral. So that's the talk, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? You have to go up to the mic. Hi, I had a question. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so you talk, covered a lot about 2D game to look, games it looked like. Um, but if you have any thoughts on doing 3D, if you 
uh, plan to do a lot of color grading and a lot of color post-processing, would you recommend maybe doing less color in the lights that you're placing in the scene? I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the question was, uh, if you're doing 3D color grading, um, what do you do about uh, a lot of the lights and that? Yeah, so when I was, hel uh, I was recently helping out a friend uh, grade his game, and uh, he had a lot of overblown stuff in Unreal, and it was really hard to kind of come back down from that. So when he uh, made the things a lot more neutral, that's when it was like a lot easier. Um, and the lookup tables that we were kind of creating really started to stick for the rest of the scene, so I'd definitely go neutral. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. How would you do, how would you deal with HDR? As you talked about a lot of lookup tables, um, low dynamic range, but now I want to do an HDR. What do you do for color grading? Um, so I don't have uh, that much experience in HDR because I am using a lot of, like my the, uh, game is for mobile. So, but it, I guess it's similar to the way you use raw colors in um, photography. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so right. flustered at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Oh, great talk. I uh, was curious if you have any hardware calibration that you do and any process to like check your colors across different platforms, different monitors. Yeah, so what I always do for this is I tend to, uh, Color space is incredibly important. Um, so what I tend to do is, in Photoshop, I tend to have like a big canvas and like make screenshots and paste all of the different color spaces. And I know it's not the uh, most accurate, but it does. It is kind of like a way to see like, oh no, is anything getting crushed? Like, are any of the tones getting like dead? The other way that I always do it as well is to uh, view things on my phone and I have this really crappy monitor at home, and that's great to tell if something is like really bad because you can just tell it straight away. So I don't ever try and get true color, but I do try and get, uh, try and get, uh, what's the word? I try and get edge cases to make sure that all the colors look okay. Cool, thanks. Hi, my name is Danny. That was a beautiful talk, thank you. Oh, um, thank you. My question is, I work on a VR game, and especially when working on mobile devices, I can't actually do any uh, post-processing. So I'm wondering if you have tools to do color grading without using post-processing a lot. The ones I could think of is doing color grading on my baked lighting or directly adjusting the textures. Is there anything else out there? Yeah, it's, oh man. So I was actually having this conversation like, like two days ago. Um, so uh, Ted Dinola, he works for Oculus. Uh, he's a great person to contact because I'm having like a lot of mental planks at the moment. Um, but he was, he had some really great advice about that because yeah, I think he was saying like bacon lighting and everything like that. I'm so sorry for like just having a biggest brain freeze. Yeah. Can but he's a again? really good person to contact, um, Ted Dinola, um, cool. and he you. works at Oculus. Um, I think that is it. Um, thank you. I'm so sorry.